Hi, everybody. This is T. Falcon Napier. Joining me, as always, is Dave Miller. Say hi, Dave. Greetings. So today is lesson seven. This is um, uh, the lesson on how to go about managing tension. So what we've talked about up to now is the change grid as a diagram. And again, very important for all of you to remember that while we do have an instrument that you can use and that can be used as a paper and pencil kind of format, I mean, honestly, you could scribble it out on a piece of paper. Um, uh, we, it also has a fully automated online uh, system that you can certainly use. The most important thing for you to take from this training is that everything that we've been talking about, everything that we've, we've been doing can be done off grid. So that means not using the instrument, not using um, the tool to do that. Um, so j just as a reminder, there is this diagram and the diagram does help you to kind of understand conceptually what's going on. And you may very well want to share the diagram with your client, but this program is not about that. Uh, it's not about the tool. It's about the, the concepts of tension management. It's about uh, a system that allows you to explore specific issues with your clients, understand how tension management comes into play and then do the most appropriate appropriate thing to help your client get to their desired outcome as um, smoothly and efficiently as possible. Uh, so the diagram, uh, just to kind of get us back to where we left off, the diagram is very uh, simple in its most basic form. Uh, the change grid uh, uh, looks at two different dimensions. That is your perceived level of ability to perform a particular activity and the level of challenge that you associate with performing that activity. Based on how those two perceptions interact with one another, we end up plopping someplace on this diagram that reveals the level of productive tension that someone's experiencing. So stress way up the highest level, coming down grid, power, stress, power, power, apathy, and apathy. And obviously you've already learned a great deal of insights and characteristics qualities you can share with your client um, about each one of these levels of tension to help them better understand what, uh, how they're responding to whatever the particular activity is at that particular moment in time. We also talked about uh, that we can look at the change grid uh, dividing into four key quadrants or four uh, uh, cardinal directions on the change grid. Those are up grid, down grid, in grid, and out grid. And today's uh, class is really all about moving on the grid. So this is what we'll be talking about directions, moving someone in the out grid direction or in the up grid direction, down grid, in grid, et cetera. Um, we also talked about the danger zone. So sometimes these four quadrants end up uh, giving rise to very extreme sets of attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that can each prove themselves to be quite problematic. We then uh, said, well, we can divide each one of those quadrants into four sub-quadrants and look at the different energies that someone can be experiencing around a particular activity. So there's a difference between being an expressive driver and a driven driver and a driven analytical energetically when it comes to experiencing and working with a particular activity. Just as another reminder, the change grid, this entire change work system is not a personality typing system. It is not a traditional psychometric sort of tool that's intended to help someone better understand who they are at their essence. The change grid simply uses the knowledge base that you have about the different personality typing systems or typological systems that you know to understand different energies that people might be experiencing around a particular activity. So when we do next week's class, I'm putting it all together. We'll be revisiting that, I'm sure, in some grand detail. Uh, we also talked about last time around uh, engagement and we looked at the different engagement rings. So this tells us that depending on where you are on the change grid, we can uh, predict how engaged you are in doing the task that uh, is in front of you. So are you actually executing on that task, um, which means completing it, killing it, getting it done? Uh, are you engaged, which means doing those things that lead to the completion of the task, but you're actively doing doing something that is um, in line with the, uh, uh, the completion side of things. Maybe you just have an intention. So you're not quite engaged yet. You're not really doing anything yet, but you do have an intention to do so. 
uh, that intention is preceded by some sort of an awareness that X is even happening or X is a possibility so that you can formulate an intention to do something about whatever X happens to be. And we talked about a, a wide variety of ways that awareness can be experienced all the way up grid, hyper awareness all the way down grid, hypo awareness, and then just plain old good awareness there. Further to the left, we have an area of the change grid that there is no specific word to describe. So I think that kind of tells you something about, uh, about life and about the English language in particular. Um, these experiences are so obscure that we don't even have a word to describe what that level of pre-awareness uh, is. So it's just something that's going on subconsciously, unconsciously, etc. So we talked about all these different layers of the change grid in order to equip you with insights that you can share with your client to help them better understand how they happen to be responding to whatever the specific activity happens to be at that particular time. So using the change grid as a tool of description. Now, you also heard me allude to the fact that um, you can use the change grid for prediction as well. So the prediction part says, well, I know this for certain. If you're going to stay down grid, you're going to stay down in apathy, I can predict with great accuracy that you're unlikely to make any forward movement. Um, similarly, if you're plotting very far upgrade where you're up in stress and you're hyper aware and all the other goodies that happens when someone is that far upgrade, um, I can predict that uh, you're going to have a lot of um, chaotic thoughts and feelings and the uh, very reactive sorts of behaviors. Unless we can move you to somewhere else on the change grid, we can predict that you're going to continue to have these um, upgrade experiences these upgrade characteristics and you can certainly look at your reference guides to review what all those may be just trying to make a point here that the change grid is highly descriptive it is highly predictive but today we're going to talk about the third element associated with the change grid and that is that it is very prescriptive as well so prescriptive basically says here's what to do now specifically the change grid maneuvers, these prescriptive elements of it, are just saying if your client would like to move themselves from one section of the change grid to another section of the change grid, here's some things that you can do that will effectively support that movement. Um, so this is really what, what it's, it's really all about. It's about saying that if the client has the awareness and understanding of how they're currently responding, and we can help them to develop more of an awareness and understanding of other ways they might be thinking and acting and behaving around that particular activity, we can say there are things that can be done to move you there. So this is where we actually get into managing tension. So with that, let's talk a little bit about these change grid maneuvers. This ends up becoming your skill set as a coach um, on helping someone to move themselves to wherever it is they want to be on the change grid. So now, in order to use the change grid maneuvers, there are two things you need to know. Number one, you need to know where is this person on the change grid. So I don't know where that may be. You're looking at a composite sort of representation of the change grid. So where are they at present? Where are they plopping on the change grid based on their perceptions? And the second thing you need to answer is where do you want them to be? Where should they ideally be? Where might be the most advantageous place on the change grid um, or the most natural place on the change grid for their desired outcome to actually happen? So we need to know those two things. Go ahead, Dave. T, we have a question from John. Yep. He said, uh, you specific, you, T said specifically, if a client wants to move, what if you feel there's a good reason to manage someone's tension, but they don't necessarily want to or just aren't even aware? Well, again, this goes back to getting clarity around what our role is in that relationship at that moment and then deciding what is allowed 
inside of the um, the boundaries we place around that specific type of relationship. So, for example, as a coach, um, I would imagine that you, that the uh, the emphasis is placed on the client being in the driver's seat. Where does the client want to go? What does the client want to do? In which case, building on what John said, it would really be more about bringing them to a higher level of awareness so they can make the informed choice. And then once they've made the choice, you can now support them in doing whatever those things are that really uh, would, would be most useful to them in moving from whatever state they're currently in to the state that they really want to be in. Now, if you uh, felt that you were in a situation that you could best serve the client, by saying to them, if it's all right with you, I'd like to change my hat. I'd like to change my role here for a moment. So rather than serving as your coach, let me step into my trainer mode, or let me step into my consultant mode, or let me step into whatever other mode you might have uh, available to offer to your client. That then changes the boundaries around whatever it is that you can be doing. Um, again, this is a course on how to use the change grid um, as a coach. Um, there's other programs we have up online about how to use it as a consultant or as a trader. So I can certainly encourage you to uh, go and, and dig through those because some of them, uh, again, based on the definition, some of them allow us to be far more directive and perhaps even a, a little bit, um, I want to say, um, clandestine in our use of these <laughs> techniques. Uh, uh, Dave, any thoughts there you want to throw in? Yeah, well, I think as a coach, there's always times that uh, through, for example, through questions, that we, we, there's movement that happens in that relationship. So sometimes it's more explicit, sometimes it's more implicit. It's, you know, the intention is never to be manipulative about it, but the coach will use questions to dig and to uh, exhume, you know, deeper insights. So, well, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And so um, in fact, just the act of doing a change grid maneuver almost always takes the shape of asking questions. And so if it's the question that is moving the person as opposed to we are moving them, then yeah. So let me position it this right. way for, for everyone's kind of benefit. One of the things that we've um, always said to uh, people that are going through the Mastering Personal Change program, and again, as a reminder to all of you, you all have access to that program. You all have your own personal change grid, and you all have the ability to gift or sell the Mastering Personal Change uh, course to whoever you want. Hopefully, you will you know, give it to your clients. But during that program, it says to them that one of the greatest um, powers that understanding tension management grants you is the ability to recognize and defend yourself against other people's attempts to manipulate you. Um, and so whether that's an advertiser trying to get you to buy something or whether that's a, a friend, a family member, a coworker who's trying to influence you, or if it's just a bully in your life that's trying to push something on you, understanding tension management and understanding these change grid maneuvers can very powerfully equip you to recognize when someone is trying to, um, to change you and allow you to defend yourself a accordingly. So uh, that might be a fun way to look at this as well. Yeah. Can I add one more thing to sure, here too? Sure. Um, I think what I've found as a coach is, is that when you learn these uh, maneuvers today, you're going to see, wow, I was already doing these things as a coach, but maybe didn't put this language to it or didn't have this lens to look through. Now I can be more intentional when I do certain things, how it's affecting someone from a tension management perspective. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I think that conceptually, if you guys were to look at the change grid for a second and just imagine that it's a map of the sea and uh, there are two islands in the sea, there's the island you're on and there's the island you want to get to. And there's now, you're getting aboard a boat to make this journey. The maneuvers is about skillfully 
you know, turning the sail to catch just the right amount of wind to move you in just the right direction at just the right speed to get you to whatever that desired location happens to be. So when we refer to these as maneuvers, we're saying these are skills that you can uh, employ and deploy in order to very um, carefully move an individual from wherever they are to wherever they want to be as gently, as directly, as safely as possible. Now we divide the change grid maneuvers into five categories and they are uh, named after the direction someone would move if you employed the, of this, that type of maneuver. So there are down grid maneuvers that move people what direction? <laughs> Surprise down grid. So these are used for lowering someone's level of productive tension. Up grid maneuvers do the opposite. They're designed for moving someone from wherever they are on the change grid to a place higher up up on the change grid. Uh, generally speaking, that's about raising their level of productive tension. Outgrid maneuvers are going to move them from wherever they are relatively in grid to a relatively further out grid location. This is about boosting someone's level of drive. And then um, we could also move someone in grid Although I will tell you that in practical use of these techniques, in-grid maneuvers are the least frequently used um, uh, in the work that we're doing. However, I uh, mentioned earlier that there are external forces that could be manipulating you. Very often you might encounter in-grid maneuvers happening there. So hopefully that piques your curiosity and uh, gets you even more intrigued by uh, what we're going to be covering in the, today's program. And then PowerPoint maneuvers are designed to move you to the center of the change grid. And I probably said this as a joke before, but um, we talked about these four red dots being the powerless points. This is where those four danger zones become their uh, most problematic. We also said that those four red spots are in fact all the exact same spot um, at the polar opposite location of the center of the change grid. Well, that center of the change grid referred to that purple spot in the middle there as being the PowerPoint. And by the way, this program, uh, ChangeWorks, is older than Microsoft as a corporation. So we've been using PowerPoint a lot longer. And I always make the joke that someday I should have an attorney send them a note. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, so far we are coexisting quite harmoniously. Nevertheless, that's the PowerPoint, the place where you have the greatest level of empowerment available to you. You may not be doing anything with that empowerment, but it is a state of a being where you really are the most centered, powerful, clear. There's a lot of great things we'll be looking at what happens in the center of the change grid as we work our way through these maneuvers. So those are the five sets of change grid maneuvers. As we work our way through the specifics, you will no doubt recognize that you are currently doing every single one of them. But rather than doing them as specific calculated maneuvers to best navigate that boat, um, it's probably happening more organically, um, hopefully not randomly, uh, but what we want to do is to add a certain uh, level of awareness so that you can perform these maneuvers in a way that's far more intentional, far more precise, far more useful to the client. Okay, before we launch into it, any questions, comments before we jump in? All good. All right, we're going to start with downgrid maneuvers. Now, if I was doing this for a large audience, um, the thing that I will just go to them, what I say to the audience, you may not know it, but all of you are already highly skilled tension managers. So all of you already know exactly how to go about lowering someone's level of productive tension. So let's say that you're in a situation where you have a friend, a family member, a colleague, a coworker, who's very far up grid. They're having a full blown stress response. So they're up there, um, they're angry about this, or they're terrified about that. They're very, very far up grid. What kinds of things do you do to lower their level of productive tension? And I throw that out to the audience and I let the audience just start throwing ideas back to me. And depending on the size of the audience, we might put a bunch of them up on a little flip chart or whiteboard or whatever, you know, whatever we wanna do, just to kind of prove to everyone, you know how to lower tension. Now, 
they say a lot of really uh, interesting things. And if I opened it up right now, you guys could throw a lot out as well. But uh, but uh, for the sake of timing, I'll give you some examples. So again, first, first let me ask the question. I'll be quiet so you can get some thoughts in your own in your own heads, and then I'll share with you some of the things I said. So, what sorts of things do you do? to lower someone else's level of productive tension. You've got a friend, a family member, colleague, coworker is very stressed out. What sorts of things do you do to lower tension? Or you could even apply this to yourself. You're very far up in stress. What do you do to lower your own level of productive tension? Now, what people um, share are things that are going to fall into a number of different categories. So there are physical things that we can do to lower someone's level of tension. There are some intellectual things that we can do. There are some emotional things that we can do. And if you think about that definition of tension you learned at the beginning of this course, you learned that tension is defined as a level of physical, emotional, and intellectual activity a person's experiencing at a given moment in time. If I can do something to lower the physical activity, lower the emotional activity, lower the intellectual activity, the level of tension is going to go down, and that person is going to move from stress down to power, stress, power, wherever. They could move all the way down to apathy. So some of the things that people say is, well, let's get them out of whatever the situation is that's causing them all this tension. So let's just help them exit from the predicament they happen to be and physically have some distance. Maybe we say, let's take some deep breaths, some nice cleansing breaths. Maybe that'll lower their level of tension. Um, maybe we t tell people to, um, to take a moment to meditate, go on a little bit of a mental vacation. Maybe we allow them to just talk it out out. Um, and so let them just share, get it off their chest. Maybe we want them to just vent. So just go ahead, you know, go on the rant, let it out, stand on top of the mountaintop and scream your head off, primal scream therapy. So there are countless things that people do to lower someone's level of tension. Now, some of the other things people will always say, and they always say it as a joke, but uh, never forget that a joke is a truth that's been carefully packaged, cleverly packaged. So they say things like, well, you know, we can give them drugs. We can give them alcohol. So, you know, we can give them a, a back rub. Well, all of those things will certainly lower someone's level of tension. Unfortunately, a great many of the things that people come up with would be inappropriate, perhaps even illegal in a business setting. So in a professional sort of relationship, there are a great many things that we might be able to do in a personal relationship to lower our level of tension or someone else's level of tension. But in a professional setting, the, 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 the choices are greatly limited. And and we're going to end up then with just four things that will lower someone's level of tension. So before I reveal them, do we have any thoughts to share about all the other crazy things that we can do to lower someone's level of tension? Uh, okay, uh, it. Yeah, I was watching a vintage movie, and it was one of those movies where someone was hysterical, and so they got slapped. It's kind of like, oh, thanks, I needed that. You know, there are countless things that lower someone's level of tension, but again, uh, some of them are inappropriate, perhaps illegal. So what can we do? These are the four things that we can do inside of a professional relationship that will effectively lower someone's level of productive tension. They are normalize, simplify, restore resources, and add resources. So let's look at each one of those in a little bit of detail, and you can uh, see how this all comes together. So normalize. You've got someone who's experiencing something that's got them all upset, that's you know got them all upgrid. If we can help them to recognize that their situation is not that unusual. Others have been in a similar situation before. This is something that was predictable. This is something that's there. So if they're uh, day one on their job and they're going, they're overwhelmed because of the, the volume of information and all the new policies and procedures and people and locations and all that. Okay, I get it. You're upgrade. But what you're experiencing is something that many, many people, all of us have been where you are today. 
And so anything that we can do to help the client realize that their situation is not the bizarre uh, situation that they are in, in that moment feeling it to be will help lower their level of productive tension. Now, will normalizing move someone from stress all the way down to apathy? No, but maybe it'll just take the edge off and move them from stress down to power stress. Uh, and maybe that's where you want to move them to. So again, remember, we have to know where are they, where do we want to move them to, so that we know which of these maneuvers to use and how much of the maneuver to actually put into place. So do we need to spend two hours normalizing it or does a single sentence do the job? But normalizing lowers tension. The second thing we can do is simplify. So simplify uh, is uh, there just to say, look, Maybe the reason why they're so far upgrade is because they're looking at the task in its, in its entirety, in its complexity. They don't know where to begin. If we can give them any sort of a roadmap to follow, any sort of a procedure, if we can break it down into smaller, more manageable steps, their level of productive tension will come down. Now, again, remember, um, other than a handful of specific circumstances, how often am I trying to move somebody down to apathy? I'm only trying to move them down to one of the more productive levels of tension, power, stress, power, power, apathy. And so maybe I just need to throw in a little bit of simplification, not try to break it down to the most minute detail and drag them through that whole experience. Um, Maybe they're in power stress where if you'll remember they're having a sense of urgency and they're being a bit impulsive and we just want them to come down to power so they do a little bit more fact gathering, do more of those logical ruled sorts of reasoning uh, behaviors that are characteristic of power. So a little bit of normalize, a little bit of simplify, you know, maybe we can move them where we want them to go. Thoughts so far? Yeah, I think coaches do this a lot. Uh, they help clients uh, really simplify complicated situations because, you know, we as people have blind spots. So Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and, and the, the big warning I'm going to give you guys about downgrade maneuvers is, uh, is this. Don't overshoot your destination. This is why it's important to know where you're trying to go on the change grid. So if they are up in stress and you believe, and are they, they're the ones that are saying, I'd like to just look at it more clearly, then power is the real desired location. Let's not overshoot the destination. Not, let's not do so much normalizing and so much simplifying that we move them all the way down to apathy. And I haven't even done the other two maneuvers yet. But one of the things that we've become very aware of, and each of you can step into the confessional and determine if this is true for you or if you know others who this is uh, an, actu an accurate description of, um, the world is filled with people that are natural downgraders, and a lot of natural downgraders find themselves in human development positions in the helping professions. So they're being driven at a very um, core level to be of service to other people. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But in our attempt to be useful and helpful and all those other great words, we could actually move someone beyond the level of tension that would ideally serve them. And now we have a different problem that we have to correct. So they may not be suffering from too much tension now, but now they've got too little tension and now we've got to fix that. So it's very important that we are always uh, administering, um, introducing just the right amount of a maneuver in order to, to uh, um, affect just the right amount of movement. Um, a good, yeah. Uh, yeah, a good way to remember this. Um, I don't know if you guys remember your grade school science class where you were first studying solutions and whether a solution was basic or acidic. And one of the things that they gave you as a as a um, um, kind of like as an indicator was a solution called phenothaline. Phenothaline was this little dropper they gave you that if you put one little drop into a solution, the solution would turn red. And that would mean that it was a base. 
And then if you added a little bit of lemon juice, you could suddenly watch all that red fade back to clear because now the solution was acidic. And so that, that, act, that, that action of adding enough of a reagent to cause this particular reaction was called titration. So if you add a little bit of ammonia, it would go red again. Add a little bit of lemon juice, it would go back onto the acidic side of things and go clear again. And you could get it to the point that one drop of ammonia or one drop of, of uh, lemon juice could get that solution to go from red to clear, red to clear, red to clear. That's when they would say it was perfectly titrated. So that's what we're trying to do. We want to make sure we are introducing just the right amount of just just the right one of the or combination of these maneuvers to get the movement to get the reaction that we're actually trying to make happen so this is where the skill comes in it's one thing to know the maneuvers it's one thing to be able to perform the maneuvers it's quite another to have uh, you know an art behind it that um, makes you very much aware of the amount of a particular maneuver to do Dave, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was going to use another science metaphor on this too that I think about a lot is that downgrade is like gravity. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I think it's easier to move someone downgrade because it's kind of the natural progression of things. Yep. Uh, and it's a lot harder if you do overshoot the destination to move them back up because mm -hmm. you're going against that resistance. So. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and we talked about this, I think, before we said that stress is something that demands attention in the moment. And so um, we're all kind of, uh, in, you know, engineered at the, at the organism level to um, deal with stress when it, when it occurs. And so definitely easier to move ourselves downward. We're really good at that. But if we're down in apathy, apathy doesn't, man, doesn't demand very much immediate attention, if any at all. And so we can wallow around in apathy quite indefinitely. And then when we do want to move ourselves, there's work to be done. And it's not work any of us want to do, as you'll see in the next screen. Uh, so as Dave just said, much easier to move people downgrade because nature is there to help you. Uh, moving someone upgrade quite the workload. So let's be very careful about how much we lower the, pros the, 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 well, the prospect of your to sales situation, the client's re level of productive tension. Don't overshoot your destination or you've got a mess to clean up. Um, now, the next thing we can do in the, for downgrading maneuvers is restore resources. What restore resources is implying is that the resources already exist the person has just lost touch with them. They forgot they have them. And again, if you're up in stress, it's not at all surprising that your thoughts are running so chaotically that you uh, could be surrounded by all the best resources you could ever want or need. You just don't remember you have them or you can't see them. They could be right in front of you. You don't know how to tap into them or you're just not tapping into them. So I think one of the very powerful things that we can do in our role as coaches is to help uh, people to re-access whatever those resources happen to be, restore the resources. So now uh, in conversation, this might sound like saying to them, well, tell me, uh, uh, tell me about it. Uh, they're in a particular situation. You say, tell me about a time you've experienced this before or a time when you witness someone else who is experiencing this similar thing. What kinds of things did you do then? What kinds of things did they do? So, and they go like, oh, well, you know, they did this, they did that. Oh, I can do that. And so it's kind of like asking them a couple of, of uh, good questions could uh, trigger for them the awareness that these resources uh, do exist, they are available, and they could readily tap into them. Now, the moment you start reminding people that they've already got resources, you can predict what happens to tension. They go like, oh, yeah, I can do this. Now put the three together. Yes, it's normal. Here's a simpler way to do it. And by the way, you've already got a whole bunch of resources. Now you can actually hear them breathe the sigh of relief. Oh, I feel so much better. My question for all of you in that situation would be, did you overshoot the destination? So if we normalize it to the nth degree, we simplify it to its most minute step, and then we restore every resource, their level of tension can now be down in power apathy, maybe even apathy. 
and now have I really helped or did that overshooting of the destination, you know, create its own set of problems. Um, and then obviously the last one, add resources, may very well be that the person it does not have some uh, necessary resource. So maybe they are lacking in the knowledge, the skill, the experience, the core physical resource, maybe that's money, time, whatever the, the resource happens to be. Um, if we give them those resources or we help them to recognize how they can easily go and get those resources, their level of tension is going to go further down. And so if you look at these four things, normalize, simplify, restore resources, add resources, I have no doubt whatsoever that all of you are, are not already fully capable of administering these four downgrade maneuvers. So you're, the big warning is don't overshoot the destination in your desire to be helpful, useful to a, another person. Let's make sure that assistance does not create an opposite and as Dave alluded to earlier, an even more serious problem. Okay. Questions, comments about downgrade maneuvers? All right, I'm sure during the discussion session, uh, you guys will share with one another times when you did overshoot the destination. <laughs> oh, Anne's got her hand up, go ahead. Anne, you can unmute yourself. Okay, so can you, I mean, what are the signs that you're in the process of overshooting so you can stop the damage before you go too far? Sure. Remember back to our um, exploration of the different levels of tension, we talked about 15 accessing cues that give you a clear indication of where someone's level of tension is. And those accessing cues were physical accessing cues, tonal accessing cues, and verbal accessing cues. So the physical one, if you're, if you're physically with the client, is probably the most powerful one to use. We can watch subtle changes in their body positions to know what's happening level of tension. So stress tends to be leaning forward, stress tends to be uh, physically agitated, lots of body movements going on, facial expressions very dynamic. Um, they're, uh, if we want to look at the other pathways, the tonal pathway, they're going to be talking very quickly, it's going to be loud on, on and on. So again, 15 access and cues. As we start to administer these change grid maneuvers, we're going to watch their body position soften. We're going to watch their gestures change. We're going to notice changes in their tonal qualities and their verbal qualities as well. And so as we start to do that, we, we know they are moving down grid. So to answer the question most, uh, most completely, as we start to uh, recognize the desired location, choosing the desired location on the change grid. It's good to ask ourselves, what does that desired location look like and sound like in, when it comes to the client being there? So if, for example, again, I know that I, uh, that power would, would serve them best in this particular place in their development. Um, uh, I have to remind myself, power looks like this. Power means they're going to be sitting upright, comfortably balanced, symmetrical in their body positions. Their gestures are going to become um, less but more deliberate, uh, more calculated. Um, their tonal qualities are going to become more um, moderated, so not as loud, not as fast. Their word choice is going to be much more selective. Uh, I'm not going to hear a lot of filler material. And so if I go back to the, the descriptions of the levels of tension and look at my, my reference guides for the, uh, the, these um, uh, cues, um, that, that's going to tell me what it really is that's going on. Another thing that also happens as someone's level of uh, tension changes is that their outward behavior changes. So for example, up in stress, the client is going to be spending a lot more time talking than listening because they're, and even if they stop talking, you wonder if they stopped in their head 
So are they listening at all? No, when you're up grid, it really is very expressive. And so they're experiencing a lot of things internally, expressing it outwardly. Um, and so, so that's it. But if I move them down to power, people in power are in an aggressive information gathering mode. So I would also expect the client to start asking me questions. Are uh, asking for clarification, sharing different options that they have, uh, even uh, coming up with their own solutions uh, that they might be able to offer. So I think there's a, a lot of things to do that. But all that said, what I want all of you to know is that you are all already highly skilled tension managers and you were before you took the first lesson in this course. And so you do know when other people around you are up in stress. You already know when they are down in apathy. You know when they're in power. So trust that instinct. Trust that inner awareness of what's going on with other people's levels of productive tension. And, um, and I, I think you'll be able to do this very effectively. Um, other thoughts, comments? Okay, so let's uh, uh, put down grid maneuvers to rest because if we've done them all, we've ended up down in apathy. So let's see what we can do to now raise someone's level of productive tension. And again, as a reminder, these are not in a particular order for a reason. This just happens to be the order that they are um, um, easier to talk about. When you're actually doing them, you can do them in any order you want. You can do just one of them and forget the others. You could do any combination of them that you really, really want. So there's no restrictions uh, around how you deploy downgrade maneuvers. Just pay attention, attention, so you don't overshoot the destination. Dave? No, I was just going to say, uh, I think as a coach, just about any interaction or intervention you do with a client is going to maneuver the client a certain way. And again, just to reemphasize what I love about this is this gives you some intentionality and maybe more awareness as to what impact that's having. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that that's good. And I think one other thing I want to throw out there is that I would wonder if it's possible for you as a coach to not be affecting your client's level of productive tension. After all, when you ask a question, you create a void. That void seeks to be filled, seeks to be filled with the answer. In that instant, a upgrade maneuver has occurred. Um, maybe you just smile at the client Generally speaking, smiles lower someone's level of productive tension. If you decided not to smile, but you were just going to sit there poker face, they're going to look at that poker face and go, what does that mean? And that also is affecting the level of tension. Just uh, before, uh, when I finished downgrade maneuvers, I, I heard Dave take a breath. And when I hear someone take a breath, I wonder if that breath needed to be let go with words attached to it, which is why I said, Dave, any thoughts? And so um, everything that everybody does is revealing what's going on with their level of tension and simultaneously impacting the level of tension that the parties involved happen to be experiencing. So it could be a question. It could be a glance. It could be a primal grunt that we go like, hmm. You know, the, all these things are communicating. And as communication occurs in any and all forms, um, change is occurring to someone's location on the change grid. So we are already skilled, but you might not have had the level of understanding of what all those seemingly innocuous behaviors um, actually mean. And hopefully this, uh, this uh, understanding of change grid maneuvers is opening your eyes to a lot of what it is that's really going on during any kind of an interaction. Um, okay, I'm not hearing any breathing, but I want to say thoughts, comments, anybody? <laughs> okay, see, because silence also impacts my level of productive tension. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, we could do a whole class just on that. Okay, mm -hmm. let's move on to uh, upgrade maneuvers. And this will probably be where we'll uh, complete today's lesson. Oop, 
went too far ahead. So upgrade maneuvers. Upgrade maneuvers are used for moving anybody from wherever they are on the change grid to a spot further upgrid. And so maybe they're way down in apathy and we need to move them up to power apathy or move them up to power. Maybe they're in power, but it's time for them to start taking some action. We need to move them up to power stress. Um, maybe the building just caught on fire. We'd like them to move now. Maybe stress is it. So again, every level of tension has a benefit to us. Uh, certain activities are ideally suited for each of these different levels of tension. So we just want to um, understand what it is that we uh, could do to raise someone's level of tension. So let me give you this as the example. You have a, uh, a family member a teenager who's decided to become one with the sofa. So they're just sitting there playing video games, um, you know, interacting with whatever their device happens to be, but there's no activity really. There's, they're not doing anything. And so you go like, what can I do to get this person to have some, take some initiative, you know, go out there, have some ambition, do something already, get off the couch, go do something. So what sorts of things could you do to raise someone's level of productive tension? Set the couch on fire. There you go, set the couch on fire. Get rid of the couch altogether. Take the device away from them. We can raise our voice. We can, um, you know, physically punish them in one way or another. Uh, withdraw food. Well, I mean, there's countless things that you, you can bribe them too. Right? You can bribe them. Yeah. If the carrot doesn't work, uh, then you know we got the stick. Maybe uh, you know, so. There's lots and lots of things that can be done. And again, if I was doing this with a big audience, I'd throw that out to them, and people will say outrageous things. They'll say, "I could pull a weapon on you." and your tension will go up. They're absolutely correct. And so countless, countless, countless things can be done that would raise someone's level of productive tension. Unfortunately, a great many of those things would be considered inappropriate, perhaps even illegal in a professional setting. And so we have to set aside all of those things that people come up with to be funny or clever or whatever. I mean, effective, though, they would still be. But nevertheless, they're trying to be clever. They're trying to be funny. Um, and we just got to say, like, all right, no, in our role as a human development professional, what is it that we can do to raise someone's level of productive tension? When we start to put that frame around it, the choices get limited and we end up with four things we can do to raise someone's level of productive tension. Those four things are increase standards, change task, awaken emotions, boost accountability. Now in your work as a coach, I promise you that all of you have already done each of these upgrade maneuvers plenty of times. So we're going to go through them again just to help you figure out what goes into what, what goes into what category. But the warning is still going to be there. You must be very careful as you use these upgrade maneuvers that you don't overshoot the destination. And so, for example, let's say you've got someone who's in power apathy. They're a client in power apathy. They have kind of like a downgrade intention, a downgrade kind of level of engagement. So they're going through the motions, but they're in no big hurry to do much of anything. Nevertheless, they have said they'd like to get this done. As long as their level of tension remains that far downgrade, progress is going to be very slow. And so what can we, where should they be on the change grid? Maybe it's power, maybe it's power stress, but I know for certain it's not stress. So, because again, remember, if you go back to your uh, first uh, lesson in the nature of change, we said that when the level of tension gets too high, when someone reaches stress, productivity takes an immediate nosedive. So if we're trying to help a client to find a place of maximum productivity, um, power stress, power, depending on where they are in the whole progression of movement towards their desired outcome, but definitely not stress. Now, as I go through these downgrade maneuver, or scratch these upgrade maneuvers, um, I want to give you a little glimpse into work that I've done with clients. So I've done a great deal of uh, training with management teams, leadership teams, executive, C-suite uh, sorts of people. And uh, obviously they're all focused on get more productivity, 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 productivity. And what they end up doing is doing 
too many of these upgrade maneuvers. And what they end up doing is moving that team of people or that individual they're trying to get more productivity out of, and they end up moving that person all the way up in distress. Where not only won't they be productive, they can't be productive. And that problem, that situation has actually been caused by the manager, by the leader, by the executive. Because they weren't paying attention to tension, because they didn't know the ideal location on the change grid to move that person to for maximum productivity, they overshot the destination and created a different problem that uh, carries with it a very hefty price tag. So let's take a look at the upgrade maneuvers and um, see how they uh, resonate with you. So the first upgrade maneuver, increase standards. So increase standards basically says this, however you're currently doing something, can you raise the bar? Can you put in place a different metric so you can do it more efficiently, uh, faster, uh, you know, making more, getting more out of it, a bigger return? Whatever that standard is, whatever form that standard takes, um, you know, it's going to be specific to whatever the activity happens to be. But if we can do something to increase the standards, to raise the bar, well, our level of productive tension is going to go up as we try to now rise to that occasion. If you'll remember back to your basic orientation of the levels of tension, we said that when people plot down grid, down in power apathy and apathy, we're looking at untapped potential. The person has achieved a state of mastery or near mastery on that particular activity. They rate their ability very high, the challenge quite low, so their ability greatly exceeds the level of challenge the task represents. Well, what happens if we increase the standards? What happens if we raise the bar? Now, the perceived level of challenge goes up, their perceived level of ability goes down, and that change in perceptions results in a, a new plotting on the change grid that is further up grid, raises their level of productive tension. So increasing the standards raises productive tension. The second thing we can do is change the task in some subtle or profound way. So very often uh, people bring up rather tedious, mundane sorts of tasks that new, do need to be done, but uh, they're avoiding them. They're, they're procrastinating, whatever label you want to attach to the lack of behavior, that's fine. So can we change the task in some subtle or profound way to get the level of tension to go up? So I'll give you some examples about subtle ways. Um, let's say that you've got a whole pile of minutiae that needs to get done, um, and you say, well, if I can get it done by 5 o'clock today, I'm going to reward myself with blah, blah, blah. So now it's not so much about getting the tasks done, it's about earning the reward. Or um, let's say that you're coming up on uh, the departure date for a vacation and you don't want a whole lot of stuff looming over your head while you're on vacation. You might change the task silly, say, it's not so much about getting the tasks done. It really is about me going on vacation with a, uh, with a, a liberated mind. So what we're really doing is changing the frame that we put around whatever those activities happen to be. So uh, the activities remain the same. They still are whatever, you know, routine, uh, minutia sort of stuff they, they are. Um, but if I change the frame around why I'm doing it. So for example, um, if uh, you are, uh, you know, haven't gone to the grocery store because you don't like going to the grocery store and you're not really doing anything, maybe the way to get you to do these little errands is not to think of them as errands you need to run, but as ways of taking care of your family because you place higher value on family than getting the errands done. Now the errands are no longer the focus. It's this idea about, about, taking care of the family. Now, as coaches, I'm sure you are all highly skilled at understanding uh, frames, 
communicating frames, changing frames around whatever it is the client uh, happens to be looking at. So changing the task in subtle ways is about changing the frame. Changing the task in profound ways are far more substantial, far more profound. If the truth of the matter is that you are desperately bored with the job that you have, uh, changing that job to a totally different job will definitely be an upgrade maneuver. Or even moving from, uh, from being in the job you're in to starting to prepare yourself to go job hunting that's changing the task uh, it's introducing a different task uh, that will have a higher level of productive tension to it so many many ways you can go about changing the task changing the task in a subtle or profound way or anything in between will effectively raise the person's level of productive tension now uh, the next one is about awaken emotions now, awakening emotions uh, requires that you know what the emotions are of the targeted level of tension. So, for example, if I want to move someone to power, the emotions that are associated with power are pride and confidence and variations of law around those. So, if I can, if by asking questions, by working with the client, help them to awaken that feeling of pride and confidence around a particular issue, they're going to move to power. If I can add to that the, the emotion of urgency, um, which is just a little drop of fear or a little bit of grief being dropped in there because I don't want to miss out on something or whatever, um, now I might be moving them up to power stress. I don't know why I would want to awaken anger or fear or grief or shame in one of my clients, but if I did that, they would move up to stress. Now, I bring those up because going back to my uh, example earlier about managers, leaders, executives who don't understand proper tension management very frequently move people up grid by awakening the emotions of anger, fear, the big one, grief and shame, probably the second most prevalent one that people do. These are highly manipulative emotions that end up being debilitating. Again, someone who's up in stress not only won't be productive, but it's not so much about resistance. They can't be productive because they're consumed by these um, these feelings, these emotions, and everything that comes along with it uh, that prevent them from being able to do the right thing the right way at the right time, etc. And so we have to be very responsible if we're going to be working with awakening emotions that we know the proper emotion uh, to support the person in their forward movement, and we never do anything that's going to uh, raise anyone up into stress. So awakening emotions. But if they're down in apathy, it's kind of like, you know, come on, take some pride. You know, if someone's starting to look like a slob, we go, you know, we start to awaken that pride or whatever. Who knows? They might decide to get up off of that couch or get out of bed and go and clean themselves up and make themselves look all presentable. So awaken emotions. The fourth one is probably the one that you guys um, do as a service to your client, and that is boosting accountability. So Accountability, we can spend a whole session just talking about all the nuances of what accountability is and how to create um, effective accountability systems for yourself and for others. So there's a lot to be gone in there. But basically, accountability just says you've decided you're going to do something um, in order to support you in getting it done. What can I do to make sure you are progressing? So it could be something that's uh, about uh, holding someone accountable to staying on track, in which case send me emails when you complete this, let me know when you got this done, whatever, um, all the way to setting a deadline and you know keeping people aware of how close they are to that deadline and um, uh, reminding them what the deadline is. Accountability is also about uh, allowing yourself to celebrate with a particular reward and also holding yourself accountable with a meaningful consequence in the event you miss whatever that deadline happens to be. So again, we talk carrots and sticks. Um, in a true uh, powerful accountability uh, system, the client has chosen whatever their rewards are going to be and the client has chosen what the consequences are going to be. We are just there as the, uh, as the uh, enforcer, 
making sure they're aware of it, making sure that they are um, uh, celebrating when they have the success by giving themselves that reward and make sure that they administer that consequence in the event that they, they miss the mark. And um, perhaps on the next uh, session, we'll talk about meaningful consequences or Dave, in your discussion session, you can talk about that. We're not talking about punishments. Punishments are counterproductive, but a meaningful consequence says, you know, you didn't make the mark this time. What can we do to make sure you have a better shot of making the mark the next time you try? That's a meaningful consequence. It's a form of preparation, targeted preparation to equip you to be more successful at your next attempt. So these are the four upgrade maneuvers. Um, again, you can do them in any order. You can just do one of them. Really all depends on how far you need to move somebody. Uh, and uh, sometimes some of them just lend themselves more to a given set of circumstances than others. Okay, any questions about upgrade maneuvers? Thoughts, comments? No. Okay, then what we'll do is uh, end uh, today's lesson here and we'll pick up where we left off next time around. So thanks so much, everybody. Reach out if you got any questions. Take care. Bye for now.